Welcome to the Getting Real with Hillary show, where ordinary heroes tell extraordinary stories during unique and never been heard before conversations with your host, Hillary Arno Burns. Hillary's unique listening and way of asking questions results in conversations that aren't usually talked about. So you can create the life that you really want, but are afraid you can't really have. We are demonstrating the greatness and the human spirit in creating a world where we all reclaim our birthright of joy, happiness, purpose, and passion. Now, here's your host, Hilary Arno Burns. Welcome to the Getting Real with Hillary show. And today we have a very special guest. And as an introduction, we're going to watch this film. Hi, my name is Linny Sturba and I'm an artist. Today I'm painting a little bit, showing you some line and form and movement and color and how I approach my painting. And then I'll end with some of my favorite paintings to share. I hope you enjoy. Okay, now that you've seen that film, you have an idea about our guest. Obviously, Lenny Sturba is an artist. She's also a licensed clinical social work, but today we're going to be talking mostly about her art and about overcoming adversity. So welcome, Lenny. Hi. Hi. It's great Hi. to see you. That was really, that film was really incredible, and I can't wait to begin asking you questions about how you create like that. I was just like, how does she know where to, how does she know what to do? So anyway, so we're going to get to that. Okay. First, we're going to go over your background a little bit and that your mom and aunt are artists and yes. that you, you were exposed to art, music, and culture very early on and you obviously gravitated toward it. And so do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, you know, I grew up with, my mom dragging me through art museums. And I really didn't know what it was all about, but I knew there was something special there. And I knew there was something really special about my mom because 
there she was, she would go off into her special place and create. And so I grew up around this magic of art and painting. Sometimes the music was on in the house as I grew up, as I grew older, the music was up and, you know, a little bit loud. So sometimes I just wanted to get away from it, but like classical music, opera, you know, as I grew older, it's like, wow, I like this. But, you know, as a kid growing up, it's what is all this? And yeah. And so when you say magic, like what was the part, I don't know if you can explain it and I know it was a long time ago, but what was the part that seemed like magic? I think all the color mm. At the, in my house, there was color all around because there were paintings all around and paintings on the floor, paintings on the walls. So it was that, you know, it was, it was being exposed to different worlds beyond what was just everyday life. And the fact that someone could create something from their own hands and create a world for someone. And that was, that was fascinating. I didn't know what it was, but I think as a child, I was very curious about it. And was, was your mom, was it when you were went to the museum or was it watching your mom create that you saw that you think? I, I think it was both. It was just that early experience. It, it was this world of beauty. I didn't feel necessarily a part of it. I didn't feel that it was my world. I actually felt like it was my mom's world. Mm -hmm. But but it was something that was there that I knew I liked. I wasn't sure how to make it mine or if it could ever be mine, but it was something that intrigued me. Mm -hmm. And was, I know when you're a little girl, you don't really think about who's, you know, making money or anything like that, but was she a full-time artist selling her stuff or did she just do it for you guys? Um, she gradually became more of a full-time well-known artist. At the time I was young, uh, she was more learning. She went and got her master's degree in art and in art history and she did some teaching. So she was always in her art. I could always tell that art was part of her identity, part of her persona. And it still is today. I mean, we're, we're having a mother daughter show in a couple months hmm. and, uh, you know, my mom is painting for that show. It, it's, it's extraordinary. You know, she lives to paint right now. And, and before you said, you know, when you were born, she's, she went and got her master's and stuff like that and was starting before you were born. Was she an artist or was that something new for her? She was an artist growing up. I think it was something her family did not encourage, okay. but she did it anyway. Okay. So was that, like, did she have to go get a different career because of that? Like, like I'll, I'll spill the beans like you did, or yeah. was she allowed to go to school for that? College. My mom said she was a really lousy secretary <laughs> and she grew up in Brooklyn. So, so it's like, I think she was fired from job after job and went to the art students league at night mm -hmm. and studied and found her passion. And then she would get whatever kind of job she could get until she met my dad. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> I mean, I've heard that before, you know, like they get a day job to support get, their yeah. habit. Um, but right, right. Yeah. You support your habit. Yeah. You support yeah. your passion. Yeah. All right. Well, good. Okay. So, so she, but obviously she became well known and it worked for her and all that. So, okay. Yes. So you're this little girl growing up and I know you said, you, if you want to tell your, um, your three-year-old red paint story, I think that's I a great one. I do have a funny three-year-old red paint story. Um, so uh, many of you could just imagine what it's like when your mother-in-law comes to visit. And um, I was being a curious three-year-old, and somehow I got into my mom's paint, and somehow I picked red. So my mom and her mother-in-law walk in the room I was in. I am full of red paint. And they thought I was bleeding. 
So it was, you know, I didn't know what was going on. All I knew was they were completely screaming and crying and running over to me and wiping me off with whatever they could. It's not easy getting oil paint off of a child, but they did it. And needless to say, they locked up all the art supplies after that. But that was my earliest creative artistic expression, I could say. <laughs> so obviously, obviously they figured out it was paint when they smelled yeah. you. Right? Right, yeah, I imagine oil paint's got a pretty strong smell, but I think it was that initial shock. I mean, it's too bad then they didn't take a picture of it. I can't see them taking a picture of it, right? You're in shock, but yeah. it's been a great, great photo memory. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's a good one. All right. So you had started your career then and you said um, you can't remember never not drawing, painting, doodling or creating. Yes. Right. Yes. I always had a, a pen, a crayon, something in my hands. You know, I, I'd spend time at my aunt's who's as an artist or my grandmother's and everyone always had art supplies for me. So why I played with dolls and all those things that kids play with, uh, art was definitely a huge part of my life. And I love doodling, which, which got me through, I think, uh, biology and mm -hmm. school and in college. And I'd, I'd have like the best drawn notebooks, you know, because you have to like do some drawings and those mm. kinds of things. So I think it helped me get through the sciences. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, but you didn't like, it wasn't like you were thinking about it. It's just what you did. It's just what you gravitated to and did right. Naturally yeah. like have a pen doodle or draw. Right. I think some of it, yeah, was very unconscious. Actually. I would just, you know, listen to the lecture, take some notes and then my hand, I'm like doing this. No one could, no one could see it, but like my hand would just start moving, dancing around and, and creating something, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was cartoon figures uh, cartoon figures that I made up, creatures, characters that I made up, or just shapes. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Real fun. Now, how old were you when you won um, the art contest for Baskin and Robbins? That's my favorite play. It's Pralines and Cream. It's oh, so yeah. <laughs> what, well, what did you do for them that you won the contest? They had a contest where um, you uh, created a poster for... 31 flavors. And uh, I'm not sure how old I was, to be honest, it might've been high school. And so I created a poster at my local Baskin Robbins and the prize was 31 ice cream cones wow. over time. Yeah. So I was like, oh, that was pretty yummy. <laughs> nice. what, do you remember what you, what your poster looked like? Like, what did you put on it? I have no idea. Unfortunately, I gave it to them. And uh, I don't know, you know, what happened oh. to it. Yeah. Too bad, right? I'm like, was it a 30, number 31? Was it different flavor? You know, like, who knows? Know. Okay, well, those are no the kind of things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So then um, you did cartooning in your school newspaper. And you, you said you did various types of art to find out uh, what you were passionate about. So... But then you didn't end up pursuing that in college. Can you tell us a little bit? Even so, right? Well, I, I I was always driven toward the arts, but I had a huge part of me that didn't feel I was allowed to do it. Hmm. I felt like my mom is the artist. Uh, I didn't really paint that much in any kind of professional capacity. So I thought it was more fun doodling, that kind of thing. Um, I got an undergraduate degree in journalism and, um, I, I, I yearned to do more. I, I yearned to do something different. And I ended up getting a master's in social work at UCLA because I thought, well, maybe my thing, even though I do all these creative things, maybe my thing is just, I'm a good listener. I can help people. But even when I was at UCLA, I would visit the art department and I would kind of want to go in there, look around, see what they were doing. So it so art kept calling to me, mm. but, it, but but I kept stopping myself because it's not practical. All those old stories of artists can't make it. 
Uh, so I had so much in my head telling me I couldn't be an artist except for something occasionally fun. And, and then um, I did end up uh, taking some personal development courses. I think we've all heard of Landmark Education and had some big breakthroughs as I kept taking the courses of, wow, I can actually create my life. I could get past these thoughts, these self-limiting beliefs, and I could start to do something that I really want to do. Now, that that's an up and down conversation because self-limiting beliefs, as we all know, don't leave. They're intrusive, they're repetitive, but you learn how to manage them in your life so that they don't stop you. And when they do stop you, then you create people in your life that have the kind of listening that keeps supporting you moving forward. So I, I dabbled in acting, screenwriting, a little bit of directing, and I kept trying to find, is this me? Is this me? And it was only after I actually broke off an engagement and my mom put a paintbrush in my hand because I was moping around her house and I was so depressed. And she said, paint. And so I started painting and she said, oh my God, it's so beautiful. It's so wonderful. And then, you know, she kept encouraging me and encouraging me. And then later on, she said it was really crap, which we both agreed. <laughs> it was really awful. It was these very uh, stiff, still lifes, you know, but it got me going. And then she just started to see me experimenting and in, in figure and in oils and in doing different things. And that's where things just started to shift and things just started to happen. And I started to believe in myself a little bit as an artist. I still didn't quite take it seriously, but, um, but it took a little time until I did. So, okay. So how old were you when she put the paintbrush in your hand? Do you think? I think I was in my, my mm, probably thirties. Thirties. Okay. 30s. And when, okay. So thirties. And when were you doing the, the landmark courses where you were going to create your life? Was that before or after? I, I It was around the same time. Okay. So I, I was already painting a little bit, did the landmark courses and then did the a course called the wisdom course which is an incredible course. And I met my mentor, Anthony Schmidt, who I still talk to today. Wow. And uh, they they had homework parties in the wisdom course where you had small groups that got together once a week. And we met at this uh, business in Santa Monica. And to me, it looked like an art studio, an art gallery. And we kept meeting and Anthony kept encouraging me to paint because in the wisdom course, you take on some things you've never done before. And I'm like, I don't have time. Do you know how many things I have to do? I am so busy. And he said, paint 15 minutes a day. How did, and, how did you know that that was a thing for you? You must have told him. I had told him. Moment. <laughs> I had told him, I, I want to paint. My mom's an artist. My aunt's an artist. And I don't have time. <laughs> and, and he kept saying, paint 15 minutes. And he kept saying it over and over. Have you painted yet? Have you painted yet? I'm like, do you know how long it just sets, it takes to set up painting it, you know, but I'm, he finally got to me and I, and I got past my huge resistance to do the thing I wanted to do most in the world. Isn't that funny that the things we want to do the most in the world, we have the most resistance to, it's kind of crazy, but so I just started so what, so the resistance, obviously you told yourself you didn't have time right. and, you know, it takes too long to set up. What do you think was underneath the real resistance? The real resistance was fear that if I start to really do what I want to do, my life's going to be disrupted. Oh, it's, I, I mean, I don't think I was that conscious about it at the time, but looking back, uh, you know, I, I think so that it wasn't, you weren't afraid of that. You weren't good. I, I or, think I, 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 I'm sure that was there too, but I think part of it was, 
you know, we get into these cozy lives Mm. and to start to take that step towards something we say we really want is huge. And I, I, so I think it was a bit of both. I think on some deep level, I knew I'm an artist, but I just wasn't ready to say it. I wasn't ready to be it. And I, and my mom was the artist. Right. And I didn't have a lot of positive reinforcement coming from my parents at the time. I think my, actually my mom always supported anything creative I did. And my dad is, you know, full-time job, health benefits, be safe. My dad's, you know, comes from an engineering background, which is very smart, you know, and at the same time, it's hard enough going after your dream without, you know, it's hard enough. You want to move forward. There are so many external things stopping you. There are so many internal things stopping you. But when you have the people who you love the most, it not in complete support, it's really, really hard. That That's why actually the wisdom course was such a breakthrough for me because I had people believing in me. I yeah. had people saying, I had Anthony saying, uh, you know, when are you going to have 10 paintings done? <laughs> you know, I, I and... You know, and the great thing is I look at it now with my dad is he's come around every time he goes on a trip, he takes my business cards, he hands them all to all strangers. It's like, look at her heart, look at her art. Mm. <laughs> but it is, you know, it is interesting, like what's in the way. I mean, I think like if I look part of it for me is, I mean, it's these three weird things, not wanting to be embarrassed not wanting to feel stupid and not wanting to be disappointed. Mm. And that's like, you know, from when I was young, I didn't like that. So my brain wants me to avoid that by not having any expectations or trying anything new, which is not a very fulfilling life. If I listen to my brain, try to keep me safe from those things. It's very preventative of going after your dreams, like you say, right? But you think if that's what you wanted and that's your dream, then it logically should just be like, go for it, you know, right? But it's not. Well, because logically you could talk yourself out of it and and you could say, oh, it's not really that important. It's like, don't trust your heart, trust your head. Mm. But really, we I think everyone's learned you you actually want to trust your heart. Your heart is wiser than your head. Right. No, but, but that's brilliant. Don't going, trust your so don't tr- I'm writing it down. Don't trust okay. your head. Trust, trust your, heart. your heart, which is the opposite of what we do. Right. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Wow. And and going back to what you said, you know, I, I remember when I was just showing, I felt so vulnerable. So there is a part of you that feels like you are standing naked in front of everybody. Like my work represented me. And of course I wanted people to like it. I wanted people to embrace it. And I think that, you know, I got really, really good response. Uh, but, but not everyone's going to like my work and that's okay because I don't like every artist's work. Yeah. But so, okay. So, so you, all right. I want, I don't want to forget these questions. Um, so one question is like the, the exploring the vulnerability piece, but the other question is when you finally, like we haven't gotten to where you actually did it and showed your art. So I want to bring the audience up to that. Okay. Um, so which, what do you think first? So Anthony was bugging you. When are you going to paint? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, I know you were. So you were, you had told me before you were in this wisdom in this uh, office that you thought was a 
looked like yeah. a studio, art studio. So did you suggest having the show there? I said, I kept saying, this looks like an art studio. We should have a show because there was uh, the business owner who ended up uh, majoring in art and hadn't really done it. There was another artist who lived in downtown LA who was creating art all the time. Mm -hmm. There's Anthony who creates works of art all the time. So there were enough of us there and we all just then brainstormed, wow, this, this actually looks like a gallery. Why don't we have an art show? And we did, and we created it. And you know, me, I'm painting in oils. Oils take forever to dry. Anthony keeps saying, uh, have you finished those 10 paintings you gave your word to? I'm like painting till 3 a.m. I'm a crazy person. I'm still doing, you know, my day job. And it is just nuts, but I am living, I am passionate, I can't wait to paint. It, it was just a tremendous time. And Anthony gave me such support. It's mm. like, you can't do any of this alone. You know, I might be holding the paintbrush, but I am not painting by myself. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm painting with the people in my life who are my support system. And I also believe I'm painting with, with my spirit, you know, my soul that's being expressed on the canvas. So, um, so crazy person painting, bringing wet oil paintings for a show. You do not do that, but I did, you know, and the guys, they hung them, they're professional. They knew how to do everything. I had a friend who wanted to be a caterer he pulled together this amazing catering. We had over a hundred people. This is my first group show. It was incredible. And you uh, finished the 10, you made 10. I finished the 10, yes. They were wet, but I finished them. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. Now, well, congratulations on that, even though that was years ago. So, yeah. and then, well, what happened with the wet before we get into vulnerable, what happened with the wet oil? Did they get wrecked or they were okay? They were fine. Okay. They were on the wall. They were fine. Okay, Eventually good. they dried. <laughs> so you did. Okay. So, so you've done your dream. Anthony's pushed you. You got the 10 done. You're a crazy right. person. And then all of a sudden you feel vulnerable. Can well, you talk more about that? I mean, I get it. But yeah, what? I think it was like right before that show, I think it was a huge thing of stage fright. And then, then just kind of being with it. And then I, I think I always feel vulnerable as an artist mm. when I'm, I'm constantly creating new things and then I'm presenting them to people and you don't want to be an artist who never shows anybody anything. I think part of being an artist is sharing it, but there is a vulnerability in it. There's like, I created this and I'm sharing it. And it's a part of me that's out there. Uh, so I think that vulnerability will always be there. It doesn't mean I can't be confident and have vulnerability. Is, the, is it though um, that they're not going to like the art or is it because it's part of you or is it not that at all that they're not going to like it? Do you know, like, what would be your worst fear? Um, I think my worst fear is that they would say, eh, it, it's like, it, you know, it's yeah, yeah, like, eh, what's, like yeah. what is it, you know, which I have said to, you know, some of the top artists in the world, <laughs> you know, it's that I've seen in museums, right? Yeah. Because for me, it's so important to bring beauty and to inspire. And when I don't have paintings that are up to my standards, I've actually wiped them out. So what I try to show to the world is the best of me. Mm. And, and it's not going to move everyone in the same way. So it's just accepting that. And at the same time, that is the biggest fear. Like when I have a show, when I'm like, okay, here are my kids, mm -hmm. right? They're like, each one is like special and unique. And I want people to love them and, and some they will and some they won't. Or sometimes I'll, 
I'll bring in some older paintings and that I've kind of forgotten about. And I'm not, you know, they're just kind of, oh, they're there. And people might say, oh my God, I want, I love that one. And I'm thinking, but I, I just did this new one and I'm all excited about the new one that I want to share. And they're like, they're wanting the one from 10 years ago. And, and so I'm like, okay, well, it, it, you know, maybe that one actually is, you know, it is inspiring to them. Yeah. So it, it's like, it, art is kind of a funny world. I'm, I, yeah. I'm exploring it myself. I don't quite understand the art world at all. Uh, the art world at all, to be honest with you. <laughs> so I'm yeah, just yeah. Well, well, I remember when I, um, you know, in terms of the vulnerability, when I published my first book and, you know, I, you know, it was all about getting it ready and published and, da, 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 and then it was there. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, people are going to read this. Yes. Like what? Cause it was myself. I mean, it was a memoir. It was raw. It was courageous. Like I said stuff that I didn't know if I really wanted people to know, <laughs> but it was too late. It was out. Yeah. And I remember it was like I had to grow into being okay with it. And I still tell people, don't judge me. You're not allowed to judge me. Or I'm not giving you the book. And, and they may or may not. I don't know. But but it really, I get, it's like, <gasps> you almost feel like you're going to die. That's how exposed you feel, right? But then I'm sure, you, well, maybe you grew into it. Maybe there, you know, you'll always have some left, but it's not as hard, right? I think as you do more, uh, each show, I I had more and more confidence. I did get like this one fellow artist, you know, made a comment once early on that said, "Oh, well, I like I like that painting. No, I actually like parts of that painting." And I'm like, "What the hell? You like parts of my painting? You know?" Yeah, which I, ones? Which I was ones? so I was so <laughs> offended at that yeah. time, but now I can laugh about it. But, you know, but let's say 10 years ago or, you know, 15 years, whenever that was, I was just, I was deeply offended. How could you like parts of my painting? Well, just, and, yeah, go ahead. I don't think I said anything. I think I was just kind of like, you know, one of those deer in headlights moments where I'm like, you know, here's my painting. <laughs> now, do you think, do you think it's because we collapse? like for you, the painting, for me, the book with ourselves, that it's not just that they don't like a part of your painting or somebody doesn't ever read the book that they bought or whatever, that, that we we collapse our value with it. Do you think? I think so, yeah, I think if I was, you know, selling sports equipment and someone yeah. didn't like the baseball bat, I, you know, I'm like, there's no attachment. Right. But, you know, but because it's so from me and I'm sharing a piece of me in every painting that I do and and the emotion comes through, the love comes through uh, right. that I I think there is something there about, wow, you 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 criticize my painting, you criticize me. Mm -hmm. I think it's very hard to separate it. Yeah. When, when you're an artist, when you're so passionate about something, I, I really don't know how you even would separate it. And I don't know if I'd even want to. It may be on some levels, it might be a little healthier to like take that back step, right? <laughs> what I can do is, uh, because I think I've grown through the years, uh, it the criticism when I get it is not what it was when I first started. Mm. So I think I've built some toughness over the years. And yeah. I think that just comes with my growth as an artist, my, my getting wonderful feedback from the world, my, you know, uh, getting in the LA County art museum sales and rental gallery when, when that was a thing, which was a pretty big deal. And, mm. uh, getting in the Long Beach Museum of Art, you know, they have art auctions every two years. And I think, you know, getting some of some exposure in some well-established venues also built my confidence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. But there still is a thing about, you know, having a show 
presenting my work. And then, you know, I, I just have to let it go. I really, really do. So it's kind of, I'm attached. I'm not attached. I'm right. attached. I'm not attached. I, I think that's part of it. It's, it's more of a dance than something I'm stuck with. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, you know, as right. your confidence grows and maybe there's a period where you have a lot of confidence and then all of a sudden you don't have a lot of confidence and you can probably handle it a lot more in the periods where you've gotten a lot of encouragement and praise versus maybe you're doing something new and you're not sure, you know? Yeah. I think it's probably, we, but we all go back and forth, you know, when, when we can take it, when it won't impact us and when it will, you know? Yeah. I, I think the biggest thing is when I could get out of that, I'm doing it for me and, and that I could get into, this is a gift for the world and it's beyond me. Hmm. And when I can remember that and, and be very connected to that, like when you write a book, when you create a painting, that there's something inside of you that needs to come out. And the more I could get, it's not about me. Cause I don't feel like I really create the painting myself anyway. I'm, wow. I'm a conduit, you know, and, uh, and so the more I could just say, this is a gift to the world that's coming through me. And my mom is very big about reminding me of that. She says, you're an artist, you have a gift. Not everyone has that gift. People have different gifts, different contributions to the world. This is yours, so honor it. Honor it, respect it. And there, there, I do go through times. I don't know if you go through writer's block. I, I went through painter's block, I guess. I'm creating that. I'm making it up, you know. <laughs> I've, I've gone through months where, like, everything that I paint is crap. It's like, and I just, you you just keep doing the work. You don't stop. You just, you paint right. crap. You paint crap. You wipe it out. You know, you go yeah. over it, you you go to art galleries, you look at art books, you, you stay in the process until you get clean or clear enough to then be able to create again. And, mm -hmm. and I think really all artists go through that to some extent uh, where, you know, sometimes you're just on this flow and it's like, for me, painting after painting, it's like, I am just... I don't even know how I'm doing it. It's just, it's all exploding. It's all coming out of me. And then there are times where it's like, I can't paint. I don't know how to paint. I forgot how to paint. Why, <laughs> why do I think I could paint? <laughs> yes. It's like, it's, am I an artist? I don't know if I'm an artist. It's like all it, you know, and then it's kind of reminding myself, oh yeah, I am an artist. And it's great to be an artist. I'm allowed to be an artist. <laughs> Let's paint. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. This this is so interesting. All right. So we're going to go to our commercial break and sure. with our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsors. And then we'll be right back. Okay. Has social emotional learning become just one more thing on your teacher's plates? Do teachers and students both find it boring and ineffective? Then bring Kikori to your school. Kikori transforms classrooms through experiential SEL activities that help students play, reflect, connect, and grow. Even better, students say it's more fun than recess. Schedule a no obligation conversation at kikoriapp.com slash bring Kikori. K-I-K-O-R-I. Do you ever feel like you can't say what you really want to say? Or that you're stuck or in a holding pattern in your relationships, career, personal life, or finances? Are there things you want in life that you've given up on? Are you resigned that this is as good as it's going to get? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then Hillary Burns, host of the Getting Real with Hillary show, has the solution you need. Hillary is a published author of three books and has a program called The Getting Real Process. This process frees you from what is holding you back, allowing you to create a life you love. Don't believe it? It is hard to believe that it could work, isn't it? 
The proof is that hundreds of Hillary's clients have used the Getting Real process and are now free to create whatever they want in relationships, career, finances, enjoying life, or just loving themselves more. So go to realtalkwithhillary.com and order Hillary's book, Real Talk, and set up a conversation. Well, thank you, as always, to our sponsors, KikoriApp.com. Um, if you want to bring experiential social-emotional learning to your schools, businesses, teams, anywhere, if you want people to be more connected, if you want them to be able to, you know, kind of get out of their own selves and, and be a part of something, bring Kokori into your teams or schools because it is a very, very special app. And as always, if you don't feel like you can communicate, I know I have times where I just don't think I could say something and I kind of get stuck, then reach out because I have a process that can really get you free. And, you know, your life just won't be the same. Every time I use it, I'm like, wow, I did not know that was possible. So you can contact me at Hillary with one L at gettingrealwithhillary.com and let's have a conversation. And now we're going to be back with Lenny. This is so fascinating. I don't know if you guys, I'm not an artist, but this is so, it's fascinating to me. Okay, here she comes. Hello, welcome back. So, okay. So yeah. And, and for me, well, for like, for me, when I was writing books, just so you know, I think it's a lot easier to delete. Like, like I wrote my first book. I thought, okay, I'm just going to go get it published. Little did I know. I didn't know how to write and it took me seven years of writing classes and editors and copy. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what I was doing, but it took seven years. And then I finally published my first book. So, you know, basically probably everything that I wrote got thrown away and redone at least, you know, a hundred times. But for you, if you're painting and you said you would do over, how do you do over a painting? Like, how can you just, like, I'm looking at the blue behind you. Let's say you didn't like that. How would you do over that? I, I would just pick, I usually uh, prime a canvas in a single color. It, it connects okay. me to the canvas. And a lot of times I will do a uh, mix a white with kind of a, a beige and uh, a, maybe a slight uh, tint of yellow. And I'll, I'll prime the whole canvas, which means using a single color over the whole canvas. And so that's what I would do if I were to wipe out one of these in the background. I would just cover the whole thing oh. with a single layer of paint. Sometimes if I find some really great pieces of the painting, I might keep it, but I feel better just starting off with a complete blank canvas. There are pros and cons to this. If I've done it too many times, the, the canvas for me is too thick. Yeah. And I'm not an artist that puts a lot of texture on paintings. So then I might give it away to someone else who <laughs> likes that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, sometimes if I've, if I've just wiped out a painting once and there might be actually some great texture in there that I could use for mm. the new painting. And, and no. so that could be a brand new beginning. I call it like the, the paintings reincarnated. You know, it's like it's getting a whole new life now. So you could actually cover that blue behind you? Like it wouldn't show through the... It wouldn't show. I'd probably get put two coats of paint and it wouldn't show and it would be a whole new painting. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I didn't know you could do that. Oh, so you can start over. Okay. You can like, start over. Like you, we can just delete a line and it's gone, you know, but it's not going to show through. Okay. So that's cool. It's and then here with writing. <laughs> Painting. It's a bit more work to actually cover the whole canvas. Yeah. With yeah. So now you were talking about like when I was watching the um, film and, um, and we'll have a link to that in the notes. It's not the full film uh, that I got to watch, but you were talking about, you know, you have a process uh -huh. to me. I was like, how do you know what color and where to do it? Like, is that when something's coming through you? How, how does that happen? I can't even, I can't even imagine, you know, being able to do that. 
Well, so, my, just, just so my process of painting is clear, and I think every artist has their own process, but for me, I have to really clear myself, and that helps with journaling. Mm. A long time ago, I learned about Artist Pages by Julia Cameron, who wrote The Artist Way. And so yeah. I do my morning pages, I get out everything that I can, and I really like to have a chance to meditate about 20 minutes before I paint. It's, I don't always do it, but I find I do the best work after that. And I, for a long time, I didn't want to meditate because I didn't feel like, I felt like everyone in the world could do it but me. And it was some strange thing. And then I learned, oh, really, it's just closing your eyes and all the thoughts are going to come in and you do your best to clear them out. And it's a great rest. So I, so I do my med meditation and I prime the canvas, which is painting the canvas in one color. And then I write the word love. I'm not sure oh, how that started. It just started spontaneously one day. I was priming canvases and I just wrote the word love in it. And it stuck as a place to start. And so that's what it, it's very different starting a landscape versus an abstract. A landscape, I have a photo, I have something to work from, working, you know, on site. Uh, landscape, I can do a very limited drawing because I like to keep it loose and then go right into the color. What you saw me painting was uh, an abstract, but there you could kind of see it's floral in a way. And and so at the end, you could see, but you couldn't see right? when you were doing it. Yeah, you know. I, yeah. I wasn't quite sure what would happen with that one myself. And it's very challenging videotaping yourself paint. So yeah. it's like, it's, that's the part that could be, uh, you know, could, being in that space of creation and videotaping is a whole big challenge. And I think sometimes I'm just, I'm just lucky how some of these things have turned out mm -hmm. but how did how did i choose the colors you know sometimes it's like it just hits me like a, a green a turquoise a, a phalo green add some yellow to that make it a little more you know of a sap kind of green color you know there's millions of greens and blues and yellows and oranges so it's all about mixing all the paint and then and having a palette laid out and then I paint very spontaneously. I don't like to have too much known. So sometimes I'm just, I'm just moving. I'm just going. It's like I'm dancing with the canvas. And I, I think for that particular one, I had a little bit of an idea of where it might go, but you see a lot of shapes, which might not necessarily fit or work together, but I just, something kept leading me towards towards those colors, towards those movements. And that's my best painting when I'm not so conscious mm. of well, this needs to be red or this yeah. needs to be blue. But it's more of I am moving so fast, I am just grabbing at paint. Because I now, don't want to lose it. Yeah. Now when you said you have a palette laid out, like do you mix the colors ahead of time? Or do you mix them as you go? I mean, you couldn't tell from the film. Obviously, you can't film everything, but. Both. Could you... Both. Okay. Yeah. Um, when I'm painting in oils, it's easier because the paints uh, last a lot longer. They don't dry quickly. When I'm okay. working in acrylic, the paint dries quicker. So okay. I might pre-mix a bit with acrylic and then put something on it so that it will stay very fluid. Mm. And the color will be rich. Wow. But in that particular yeah. painting, there wasn't as much mixing of colors because what was more important to me was the, the shapes and mm. letting the shapes lead into something. Wow. I mean, it was so beautiful, but I certainly didn't know, you know, when you first started and you're just, I'm like, no idea what where she's going, but but it was fascinating to see what it ended up and how you do it. I mean, so are you like being led to do it? Like you're not like you said, when you're not thinking about it, it comes out better, right? Yes. Yeah, I think 
to get in that place, like I, I would imagine when you're in anything we do, if we could just, it, it, when we are so into it, we're not consciously thinking of A, B, right. C, D, right? It's just, we're doing it. We're, we're mm -hmm. so present. We're in the dance of it. In the flow. And, yes. and we're in the flow. We're kind of lost. It's one of those things of, okay, I'm going to paint for two hours and it's eight hours later. And I'm like, what, what happened? Why is it dark outside? You know, that kind of thing where you're just wow. you're going, you're going, you're going. Yeah, it's like it's that losing of time and it's it's a healthy losing of time. It's a joy mm -hmm. to be participating. It, it's all about being in that present moment. And then and then I think the partnership of letting letting me just kind of I don't, just be used up mm -hmm. and 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 just let everything in me just come out. And like, it, I guess a writer pours it on the page, right? I'm pouring it on the canvas. You know, I'm just, I'm wanting to get it out. I'm wanting to release and I'm releasing from a place of giving love, which is wow. why it's so important to write love on there. Now the love usually doesn't show in terms of like, I'll cover up those actual words, but it just gives me a starting point. That's so cool. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because I was like, there's some letters there. It looked like love, but I was like, but yeah, so that explains it. So thank you. Yeah. That's that's really a great idea, you know, wherever that came from. So cool. Because then yeah. it reminds you, it's like a structure for remembering the love, you know? It is. And I, you know, it's not important to every artist, but it's important to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, artists paint for many, many different reasons and to get out many, many different expressions. For me, it's about beauty and inspiration. So I want someone when they have my painting around them to feel that. And I've been told by many people, they feel it. Mm. And, and there's, you know, as a therapist, I really was aware of the healing power of art when I, when I wasn't painting as much, but I was seeing more clients and my clients would come into my office and my mom's paintings would be in my room and my clients would look at the paintings and they would feel this sense of soothing mm. and serenity. And it really made a difference to have that kind of environment for, for therapy. And then yeah. I, as I learned more, took classes, took courses, grew as an artist, I was, and I did a little research on the healing power of art, and I was very clear, this is something I want to do. It's like, I, I'm, I'm not a therapist by accident and an artist together. It's like, why did these worlds join? And I think they joined yeah. because, because there is such a healing power of art. And one time um, I had a client who purchased one of my paintings and something happened to her son and her son went through this terrible time. He had to have surgeries. He had some mm -hmm. kind of unknown illness. It was very, very scary. And she told me afterwards uh, that she would look at the painting every day. And I think the painting was called joy. Mm. And she said the painting helped her through the time. And that was like, and, I, and it was just random that I bumped into her after yeah. like a year later. And I'm like, wow, that I really, that it, it it's like that, that's healing. When you get yeah. something in your space and, and be inspired or be soothed or be excited or be whatever you're meant to experience from that work of art, that, that, yeah. that. That, that that just blew me away, actually. And was her son okay? I just have to ask. Of course, yeah. Her son okay, was good. okay. All right, yeah. good. Okay. There's a happy ending to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't leave, like, the cliffhanger. Yeah, there. yeah no, I was like, okay, I, I just have to ask yeah. here. All right, so we only have about four minutes left. Sure. I know we want to talk about, you know, how people find you, um, your, you know, obviously your beauty and inspiration, Um 
So where, like, how would someone find you, first of all? if I know you have a website, but why don't you say what it is, um, and we'll have it in the notes as well. Sure. Uh, my website is Liddy Sturba Art, and I'm also on Instagram at Liddy Sturba Art. And okay. um, I have an upcoming show with my mom in Malika Cove Library. Uh, they have this amazing room. I'm going to have about 15 to 20 paintings and so will she. So this is a big show. If you're in the Southern California area, all of the information will be on my website. Okay. And what is that near since I don't know, just in case. Uh, Mexico is uh, Palos Verdes, California. It's near okay. Redondo beach. It's okay. about 25 minutes from LAX. Okay. All right. So they can go to Lenny Sturba Art, and we'll have that all spelled out in the notes so they can find you at .com. And okay, so that's how you find her there. Yes. And then for the last few minutes, why don't you talk about, you know, your commitment for the world and where, you know, what impact you want to have, where you see the world in five years, that kind of thing, your vision. Okay. Well, my commitment for the world is beauty and inspiration through art has people connected to their shared humanity. And that is, that just touches my heart every time I say it. And, um, I recently was part of humanity day, which is, uh, a group of people that are really creating, uh, humanity and peace in the world. And, um, being able to carry that vision with me every day and to believe the healing power of art. I don't always see that in the art world itself. In fact, I went to an art show recently and I was a little depressed by it because I felt like there was a lot of art that lacked passion, that lacked inspiration. Now this is all my judgment of it, of course, but, but it, but I didn't walk in there inspired and 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 full of life i i i i walked in there just kind of wow this, this is kind of the who's who of art people and it it just it it, it wasn't what i would have created mm -hmm. so i think that made me even more passionate about what if people really knew the healing power of art um and whether you know it's just for yourself having a sketchbook and doing something that has you feel good or going to an art museum or uh, just being inspired by beauty, walking in nature. You know, there's uh, during these times that we live in when there's a lot of chaos, a lot of war, a lot of separation, we forget that we're all connected as human beings. And, and that's why I'm really committed to beauty and inspiration through art has people connected to their shared humanity because we are a shared humanity and we forget that in our to-do lists and in our everyday things uh but we all have a gift to share we all have something to give and i would really for the next five years i'm just going to keep doing what i'm doing and and keep sharing what i'm sharing and you know i really believe that that people can be connected through art and and through whatever it is mm. so, so that's what i'm passionate about and and you know just beauty and inspiration it's like that's what i just it charges me yeah. up it lights me up you know marion williamson talked about letting our light shine and when we let our light shine, it automatically, I, I'm not, I'm quoting her wrong, but it lets other people's light shine as well. And if we all took on embracing our own passion, embracing what brought us joy, being committed to bringing the world joy, or at least your next door neighbor or your best friend, right? And, and then respecting everyone has a gift to give. Mm, beautiful. Well, thank you, Lenny. Um, I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate your generosity and sharing your art, uh, wow. you know, your beauty and inspiration, your healing through. I mean, it's just so what such wonderful topics and the shared humanity. So thank you for bringing that to the world. Thank so you, Hillary. Good.
Thank you for your amazing listening and your grace. It was really fun having a conversation with you and laughing and enjoying enjoying yeah. this time. All right. Well, come back next week, folks. We'll have some more inspiration. Thank you, Lenny, again. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode. I started getting real with Hillary when I discovered that I was a people-pleasing, pleasant phony and wanted to be more of my real self. We can grow together if you will like the show, subscribe to my channel, and share this episode with your friends and family so that we can have a world that's more real.